I think governance principles guide us towards having good governance and good governance increases our chance of achieving successful outcomes for the sport and the best chance of realising our vision. And particularly during challenging times and times of change and, and crises, the principles provide that guidance in how to manage, protect and improve an organisation. And I think um, particularly at the moment with the external pressures that we have and the increased risks that sport is having to deal with uh, from a whole range of um, different areas such as societal expectations through to, to COVID and safeguarding young children, uh, the need for relevant governance principles in sport is, is actually heightened. And I think that if we have uh, governance principles to guide us, then, then everyone at every level across the sport can gain a, a very clear and common understanding of what good governance looks like. And that helps us to have uh, consistency and alignment in the approaches that we're taking. And as a result of that, we probably have a, a more stable and better performing cohesive organisation. Um, and the other way of looking at it is if we didn't have the government's principles, there'd probably be chaos in our sports. The way that I see governance is through the prism of uh, decision making. It's there to ensure that we're making good decisions for our organisations and we all want to do that. So it's within that construct that, you know, we need to ensure that the decisions we're making are, are clear, they're consistent, we're adopting collaborative decision making or collaborative processes and we're effectively communicating across all branches of the organisation and all of that has to be done within the constructs of our values and purpose. So I, I, I feel that it provides the, the foundations for, for all of that. I really believe it's important to have a standard set of principles across our whole of industry. Um, it helps us or well, they will help us to govern at a really high standard and I think um, I think uh, Rob mentioned before, we're all really passionate about working in sport. Some of us work in small organisations, others are in large, and we've got different levels of, of education around governance. So having these sorts of principles and the tools and resources that sit behind it, behind them will really help us make sure that we can um, govern within, our, within the sports sector um, and help us put it into practice, which I think is the most important thing. And that's what I like about these principles. They've got some really clear directives of what they mean and examples of what they mean when you do put them into practice. As you know, I've been on a number of boards for a number of years at different levels, and I think it just really does assist with appropriate decision making. It provides uh, appropriate strategic direction to both the board and, and the staff. Uh, it assists with uh, accountability because those responsible, being the board or the management committee, are also accountable for their decisions. And it assists with transparency as well, because I think the biggest challenge in many of our federated structures is perhaps that lack of trust between the governing bodies and their member organisations. So I think having that degree of accountability and transparency certainly assists with that level of trust and building that level of trust. Uh, it ensures that you have robust uh, processes and procedures because that's really important when it comes to integrity and building that trust. And it provides a, a level of process for, for your members and, and they can see that there's they've got confidence in the processes and procedures. It also sets uh, the culture for the organisation. I know Rob spoke about a lot about uh, values and, and behaviours, and to me, that's what culture is. Culture is about behaviour, and it's about um, actually showing that. And as, as a board and as directors, it's really important that we model those behaviours and those values in order for our members to actually um, see what those values are and the importance of those within the organisation. And lastly, it's really just so directors have a very clear understanding of what their roles and responsibilities are. As a director at any level, uh, whether it be club, state or national, uh, we have a, a level of responsibility. They're called your fiduciary responsibilities and it's really important that there's a clear understanding of what they are and that, that they can be fulfilled as, as best as you can. Because at the end of the day, I mean, my adage is that you want to leave an organisation in a better position than when you started. And I think having good governance principles and, and living by those uh, and exemplifying those is really important from a governance perspective. Mel and I have had a common link in the governance space with state sporting bodies in Queensland for a number of years, um, uh, including Q Sport running, uh, an induction program uh, to make sure that people who become uh, appointed to the board's management committees of state sporting organisations who are the Q Sport members, 70 of them, 
um, that the people that arrive there um, do have some idea of um, the industry they're coming into um, and what support is there. But more importantly, um, that they understand uh, the roles and responsibilities that they have taken on. Um, and we find, of course, that some people, um, how they arrive on the board of a sporting organisation um, varies from um, instance to instance, and they don't all arrive, you know, with a degree in governance. Um, they don't even arrive in some cases with a lot of experience in governance. But the reality is that um, particularly as they are volunteer um, resourced in the main, um, that uh, we have a responsibility and they have a responsibility to the people that put them there to run the organisation, particularly at state level, where they administer and conduct competitions, uh, responsible for development activities, promote the sport in the state jurisdiction, um, that they do that in a way that um, avoids dysfunction, um, that we don't end up with organised chaos, um, that we do have a clear idea of um, what we're there to do, or what they're there to do rather, and they can only do that if they have some disciplined approach to what it is that they're trying to achieve with the resources they've got. And we all understand that many state sporting organisations, uh, basically the task is, the, the, the task rather is almost how long is a piece of string. Um, and um, they're basically responsible to, and there to assist uh, in our case here, something like 7,000 groups of seven people on a, on a club committee. It's 50,000 yeah. volunteers who are responsible for the delivery of, of community sport. And um, across the board, um, we, are, we need to make sure that they understand what's required of them uh, to ensure that the image of the sport, the attractiveness of the sport. Um, and, and, and while I have believed over many years that good governance is important, um, at the end of the day, it's the experience that uh, that the uh, participant gets when they come to a club environment and um, good governance actually optimises the chance that the experience that is provided through that club uh, is as optimal as the resources uh, allow. Being a director can be hard. Um, it can feel lonely um, and it's a lot of pressure sometimes without the, the safeguards around how or what or, or why. Um, when you join a sport team or a sport for the first time and you go to step onto the court or the field and, and you're trying to learn the rules of the game and you're trying to learn who's in your team and, and, and you're trying to learn, you know, what the referee's doing and, and what the coach is saying and, and how long things go for and, and what you're supposed to do. Um, being a director is not, not particularly dissimilar to that. So the government has an opportunity to set out the rules. Um, to set out, you know, why the rules are important and, and how you can strengthen and how you can improve your skills and, and capability. And um, by integrating them with uh, resources, the, the resources which are on the web page, as well as um, the active resources, either through, you know, the WA Department of Sport and Rec or, or Sport Australia, um, we hope that um, you'll feel well coached and you'll feel well supported to achieve the absolute best um, outcomes you can. Um, improve your participant experience and the overall um, integrity, effectiveness and, and outcomes of your organisation. I think what it does initially, it really does set the framework in terms of the model that should exist between uh, the national body, um, the state body, its clubs and its key stakeholders within the sport and outside of the sport. Um, I, I think if we don't have that relationship, I think governance, you know, if it's done uh, individually, to me, does create a lot of challenges. And I, I think certainly for us at our state level, I think it really adds a level of legitimacy and, and credibility to the organisation and the sport. And and I think it, it's, it's really critical um, to eradicate, I, I think, what I would see as um, unsavoury uh, behaviour and values that can be displayed. Um, and should should provide strong guidance into the sort of values and behaviours we do want and, and certainly guide us in terms of shaping our strategic plan. The, the reality is those principles should be captured in our strategic plan that provides the guidance of, of the organisation and the sport. Um, you know, and and really it's, it's what sets apart, I think, good organisations in from bad organisations 
in terms of decision making, um, those procedures, those processes, those governance um, really allow us to make those good decisions. And, and I think it becomes very much a safety net for us, the, the principles. Um, and, and certainly given, as you mentioned earlier, Ben, that, you know, the merging of Little Athletics and, and Senior Athletics in WA, uh, I've got to say this document is, is perfect timing um, in, in terms of really becoming a reflection point of now where the new organisation's at, where the board is at, where its management's at, where, where its members are at. So critical, absolutely critical for us. The principles, I guess, provide a foundation for how the organisation is established, constituted, uh, what its membership could be, provides guidance to the people responsible for running it, both board and management roles, and how it's directed. And I think a very important role for Sport Australia is to provide a set of principles that sports can utilise to make itself you know the best it can be no matter what shape that takes i guess to summarize yeah you know, the, the foundation of a sports governance does start with principles and i think it's critical that they build on it from there yeah thanks jason um so yeah similar the principles uh, provide sort of an overarching and help set direction for us so having um an understanding of what the principles are and especially with these principles being a whole of sport approach, it allows us all to sort of uh, achieve best outcomes and have an understanding of how we can achieve those best outcomes. It assists in uh, decision making. Um, and then, as Rob mentioned, it, it allows that process to be transparent um, and show accountability for our directors, for our sports and down to our players and um, volunteers of other clubs and associations as well. So um, it also helps set that culture that Rob was talking about for an organisation. So um, culture, as we all know, is very important in ensuring that we can deliver of what we do and work collectively um, together to deliver. So having all them there certainly makes it important and helps assist in us doing the right thing. I think the challenge for all sports, I think it was summed up in, in the in the slides, but as a board uh, and particularly as a, a, a national board that's working with in cooperation with um, our federated system here in Australia, we, we need to make complex decisions and we need to make those across the sport and, and we want to do those consistently to deliver the optimum results. And without a governance structure in place, you're doing those on a, uh, you lack that consistency. And so for mine, the governance is really about laying that bedrock, that foundation, so everyone knows and has that clear line of sight on how we operate, who we are, what we stand for, common values, common strategy. And that enables us then to get on and then prosecute that ac across the sport. Without that, you spend a lot of time uh, managing issues as they come up and you lack that strategic long-term goal. So you're always in that immediacy of doing the urgent things rather than looking at that long-term success and ultimately for us, we want those dual goals of sustained elite performance and increased participation. And we can only achieve those two things if we have that solid bedrock of good governance. So I guess that's an opening quick quick view of uh, why I think it is. I could talk for hours on governance, but we won't do that just yet. There's probably a couple of things and some of them may already have been covered. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of sport in general, um, you know, the majority of probably sport in this country is um, sort of governed by volunteers, um, but quite often wear multiple hats. Um, and so, um, you know, so a framework and principles in general, um, they sort of enable, I guess, the, the user or the volunteer to, to be able to sort of see holistically what sort of is important to the organisation, but also, as we mentioned, sport in general. Um, so, so when we're wearing those multiple hats, it provides a bit of structure and a bit of guidance how we're making decisions. Um, but by having principles um, that, that underpin that framework, I think it, what it does is it allows flexible application depending on the situation. Um, and I think you know it, what it does is provide you know some fairly complex and technical um, uh, things around governance and puts it in a language that's, that's easy to understand um, for, for the average user.
Um, as Rob was talking about the process uh, we went through, and uh, I think there were three common threads that we heard from club administrators, from SSOs, from NSOs across the board. And um, the first was around simplification. So how do we make uh, the material accessible and understandable uh, to everyone? Um, the second was around education. So how do we use the governance principles as an education tool and uh, not just a, a measurement or, a, or compliance tool? And the third was around collaboration and behaviour. So how do we call out that sport is quite a complex ecosystem and how do we uh, have some principles in there that, that look towards that alignment between stakeholders, be they club, association, SSO or NSO. So, um, when you look at the principles, and I'd really encourage you um, to jump onto the interactive website that's been developed, which is uh, available at Sport Australia, uh, and it starts to talk to those things. So we've grouped, so the simplification, we've grouped the principles uh, into nine really easily digestible chunks. Um, we've used language which is sport specific and, and, and is in language that people who are new to governance can understand and can understand their requirements and also how they can be applied. Uh, for an education piece, um, for each of pr these principles, and you'll see if you do visit our interactive website, is there's a there's this whole suite of resources that people can go to to use. So it's, it's one thing to understand the principles, uh, but the team's also put together a whole stack of resources uh, that can help inform and develop uh, you know, the performance in that principle. And then the, the collaboration behaviours I spoke about being that, that third you know, theme when we did the co-design. You know, principle one, spirit of the game, and principle two, you know, the team directly call on that collaboration across the sector. So in terms of the change of focus between you know, in the evolved principles, it's really about the simplification, uh, it's about the education, it's about that collaboration and behaviours. And they, they were the main changes we wanted to embed into the material uh, and, and make a real step change in governance of sport. These principles are a little more sporty. You would have seen from, from Rob working through them that we've tried to pick up um, a language that is quite familiar um, to those of us who have been a part of sport. Um, at the start line, we actually talk about the fact that a lot of people stepping into the boardroom is in fact quite similar to stepping um, onto the court or onto the field for the first time. You don't necessarily know all the players, you don't necessarily know all the rules. So we've set the principles up with that sort of tone and antenna and that was a clear feedback from phases one and two of the whole of sector co-design process. The sector wanted our principles to be more accessible, more educational and, and more informative. Um, and in fact, um, at the design lab we hosted where we really drilled into um, draft principles. And we'd done the first two phases and we were quite clear about, um, well, we thought we were quite clear about uh, what the sector wanted. And we were quite proud, our team, um, of, of the draft document that we took into that design lab. And we were told we'd got it wrong. We were told that it was still too formal, that the language um, was too corporate, that that it didn't hit the mark in terms of our audience. In fact, a lot of the things that Peter just spoke about, optimising the sport governance environment in order to achieve the participant um, uh, experience in an optimised way. So these principles, they don't just highlight the what, um, but they also highlight the why and the how. Um, and when you access them online, you will see that we've also integrated um, a number of resources now as well. So. We talk about a board charter, um, but we've also got examples of board charters um, now available for our, our directors and our committee members online. So you don't have to start, start from the beginning. So we really help, uh, hope that by, by taking this, this focus, which is um, on our sector, um, that we've, we've hit the mark in terms of what will make these more accessible, educational and informative. Um, in terms of the mandatory sports governance principles, um, we now have the sport governance standards. So these are the measures by which both Sport Australia and the NSOs will evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of their governance systems and processes um, under the principles. So um, our new sport governance standards replace uh, the mandatory sport governance principles. 
and they're really going to bring the principles to life in practice. So the standards have also been co-designed with the sports sector and the key lessons that we took out of the co-design around the standard was this sector wanted an increase on, well, an increased focus on accountability and transparency and with the main aim being continuous governance improvement in all sporting organisations. Without um, getting the finger, um, it wasn't about sort of saying you're doing a good job, you're doing a bad job. Identifying areas where there was opportunity for improvement um, and then working with sporting organisations to create that improvement. So it's meant to be an organisational governance uh, evaluation um, and by using that tool, they will be able to work with uh, the national sporting organisations to, um, to advise, to support, to resource, to educate, um, to bring it to life. Um, one of the big changes that people will see in the sports governance standards is that there are now four measures against each standard. And what this uh, was brought about by was a clear commentary um, from the sector in the co-design that the standards would have maximum impact if they were structured to acknowledge no two body organisations are the same. Um, and, and we've talked about um, the importance of uh, volunteers and that the governance of sport only operates because volunteers are, are incredibly generous with their time. Um, so the sport governance standards look at the maturity of the organisation and accept for one sport organisation um, may never be good practice for another because of different aspects of the way in which their organisation um, is measured. So hopefully um, the standards in, in conjunction with the new sport governance principles will allow our boards across the country um, to develop governance improvement plans and, and have that further support and education um, in order to bring governance to life. Rob very well articulated uh, the co-design process that the team's undertaken over the last 18 months. And this, the feedback from the process really did shift our approach to the governance principles. Um, they've been designed in a way to be more accessible, um, educational, and a tool for organisational development across NSOs, SSOs, and the sector at large. So that's a, that's a seismic shift from where we were with the previous version of 2012 and the mandatories of 2015. Um, probably picking up a bit of Annette's point um, she just mentioned, uh, the content of the principles more reflects the governance environment of sport and can be more easily applied for all sporting organisations. So whether you're some of our most well-funded sporting organisations to, to some small organisations that are governed around the kitchen table, these principles really do resonate with all, with all organisations. Um, you'll see throughout the principles, there's a there's an emphasis on behaviours and value, values and collaboration and really bringing those principles to life um, through the behaviours and actions. So that's probably a few points uh, where we've landed through the, the co-design process. I think um, just the fact that it was a co-design process to start with was incredibly valuable. Like Rob's painted the picture, it's a very diverse sector, the sports sector, and there's national, state, local. So, so it's vital for collaboration and, and you know for us all to know what our role is to, to actually do it properly co-designed. You know, we've got some incredibly knowledgeable and talented leaders in New South Wales like Aaron. Um, and it was great for them to be able to really input into the into the whole process. Um, I'm a bit of a Luddite, so I learned some new things like what the hell's an online jam and a, a design lab, um, which was, but, but I guess that showed Sport Australia's commitment to, to really making it accessible and getting that range of people. Um, the design lab I was involved in had an incredibly eclectic range of people from all throughout different sports who who had something to contribute to governance so um and, and i think also it's a framework moniker as well it's not just the principles it's resources um it's you know a whole framework around it which i think um, has been incredibly valuable it's been great to be involved in this process sort of from the start um, when we have workshops and not only from for sport and recreation victoria but to have a diversity of organizations from within the sector in victoria involved so reaching out through clubs through sport jams our regional sports assemblies fully run volunteer run state sporting associations up to our large state sporting associations so to work with them and get an understanding 
um, and background of their knowledge and experience of how this all applies out in the sector and how they apply principles currently um, to help develop some principles that are clear and adaptable and will be able to address a diverse range of organisations within the sector to support them in developing clear and strong governance um, within their organisations. I think, um, you know, in general terms, any uh, opportunity where we um, seek to effectively engage with um, our peers and stakeholders um, and colleagues um, and try and get meaningful and genuine feedback um, is the right way to go. Um, I wasn't directly involved in this process, but in preparation for this session, I sought some advice from our colleagues um, who were contributing into the process. Um, and one of the things that they said was, you know, they, they felt it was a genuine um, co-design collaborative process and, you know, cited examples where um, feedback was, um, was provided and taken on directly and reflected um, in the documents. Um, and I think, you know, that speaks volumes about um, the genuine nature of the feedback um, and it wasn't just a tick and flick exercise and um, you were actually seeking um, to take on the views of um, all stakeholders across the country um, because I think as a few others um, have touched on the federated nature of our business and the decentralised operating model and the volunteer driven um, nature of our governance, um, you know, we, sh we can't shy away from those challenges um, but I think going through these sorts of processes and you know Rob touched on um, governance being about decision making gives us the opportunity um, to appreciate the fact that you know one decision impacts on many others and taking a decision um, isn't just about the impact that it has on yourself um, so um, going through a genuine consultation process to um, acknowledge and celebrate the differences and the differences um, between where we sit within the federated structure um, I think was was valuable. The other thing um, that I think um, is represented in the product um, being principles based um, allows that to be applied um, wherever you sit um, in the structure, whether it's you know a, a big national organisation or a small club um, in regional Queensland. Um, you know you can apply those principles um, uh, equally. Um, well, I've well, I've got the floor if I can indulge for a sec. Um, and it's not specifically about um, governance, but it is about engagement. Um, I think Rob also touched on um, the nature of the circumstance we find ourselves in right now um, and these, the situation that we're all working our way through. Um, and I think the way that our sector has come together um, here in Queensland in particular and some of my colleagues on the on the call, Peter and Mel, um, I think this opportunity has provided us a chance to, um, to engage differently, to engage more genuinely um, and think about um, our similarities as opposed to our differences and how can we can come together and form a strategy which is essentially what um, what governance is all about is um, you know setting the path and making decisions and directions for um, our constituents to follow and I think um, there are some things for for us to take away not only from the existence of governance but um, the, the situation we find ourselves in and how we can continue to learn from that we have used co-design principles traditionally in delivery of infrastructure so it's a really an exciting way of gathering different points of view by doing it in a manner that has some clear expectations and it's in a respectful forum so people can have differing points of view but it's how those differing points of view are acknowledged and, and treated with respect and then you get a little bit more collaboration and progress it from there so um, it's the first time I've seen it applied in a in the development of a standards approach versus delivery of infrastructure but you are able to uh, quickly get a range of ideas and work out where there's areas of agreement and where there's areas for further discussion and collaboration. But um, from this one, I'm really happy that there's a focus on the values, the culture and the collaboration up front. So that way, those generally set the tone for how a project's delivered, whether that's an infrastructure project or how a sport's governed or how it develops a new program. So without that agreement of values, culture and collaboration up front, it doesn't matter what structure or form follows out of that. Um, you're, you're never ever going to have that uh, well-rounded approach. One of the first things we found really valuable was the direct access that we and also state sporting organisations had through the workshop. And then the further consultation opportunities offered through the jams. Um, and as much as there's sometimes frustration with the length of time it takes to do things, if a process is to be truly collaborative, it does take time. So that sense of being involved not only at the start, but also throughout the process, 
And I think the opportunity to see reflected in the progress that was made throughout the process in our own input. Certainly the opportunity for us to work um, across with Sport Australia and also to work with the state sporting organisations at things like the workshops so that we could hear firsthand but also provide firsthand information in and the ability to be able to reflect both the sector here in Tasmania and our own organisation in terms of things like the language and what was important to us. Um, in regards to the, the co-design process, the office was pleased with the different methods of engagement throughout the process. As Rob alluded to earlier, um, we were involved in the face-to-face -face workshops from the very beginning, the online jams and other feedback loops. So we found that um, you know, really beneficial. Um, we certainly appreciated Sport Australia's willingness to travel around the country to host the face-to-face -face workshops in the initial stages of the process. Um, and I have no doubt that by doing this, you've created a greater buy-in to the process. Uh, as a result of the engagement is a final document, in our opinion, uh, that speaks to the sector in a language they have chosen and reflects all levels in the sector. What I mean by that is the larger organisations right down to the smaller organisations can benefit. In preparation for tonight's launch, uh, my team also reminded me of a discussion point that was raised in South Australia's first uh, workshop. Uh, and that point was the need to develop a document that not just informed, but also allowed boards to assess themselves against the principles and understand how they can improve. Um, so it's really pleasing that Sport Australia have listened to this feedback from the sector and provided a resource, including the sports governance standards that enables organisations to undertake this process. Um, finally, some, you know, some pleasing feedback from organisations um, within our sector that the engagement process demonstrated a strong commitment to ensure the national principles suit the needs of our sport and recreation organisations, which is a really good result. So overall, um, the Office of Recreation, Sport and Racing has been really pleased with the level of engagement throughout the process. And, and I would just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my team who invested their time into this process to, enjoy, to ensure our voice and the voice of the sector uh, was heard. So thanks for your efforts and contribution team. In an operational sense, we will do the same with these principles that we've done with the previous versions of them. We'll, we'll take them to our board, we'll, we'll look at them, we'll map them across to our current practices, uh, and then we'll have a, an active discussion around the merits or otherwise of adopting the principles for our respective operation. Um, in terms of the in terms of the principle that we see as being most valuable, it's <laughs> It's, it's a difficult answer. It's a different, difficult question to answer because they're all quite, they're all obviously very important and all very interrelated. But echoing what Robert was saying earlier, for, for us it comes down to values um, and um, looking at how we can ensure that the, the will of the board is effectively being, um, is being effectively communicated and, and effectively bought into by the, the membership as, as a whole. Uh, because in some sense, the the principles themselves are the easy part. Uh, it's it's taking people along for the journey and ensuring that the whole organisation is is following them is 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 where is where we need to be focusing our attention. To me, the evolved principles um, are produced in a manner that really invites discussion, and I think they're rich in ideas and and full of really great discussion starters. And so that's the feature of them that I utilise. Uh, to initiate the implementation. And I think it's inevitable that as soon as any of the, the directors on my board uh, read the evolved principles, they're going to just start mentally ticking off what we currently do and what we can't do. Uh, so I think it's a very natural starting point that we do an informal internal review of what we have in place to meet the principles and, and what we might have a little bit more work to, to do on. Um, so I think it's a, a really important starting point to gain familiarity with the principles and uh, also develop that confidence that we already have a lot of this in place so that we see this document 
not as something as a, a whole new list of things that we need to do, but see it as a, a document that's been produced to support what we're currently doing and to assist us in evolving our own practices. And I'd be encouraging our state boards to undertake the same type of review, then look at areas that we might have in common uh, and see what sort of uh, education or, or development we can put in place to work on together there. Uh, so principle eight, the best and fairest, uh, which is about a system for ensuring integrity is the one that I think we'd start with that would be in common because this is an area that we're working on together. And I think the way in which the sections of the principle are set out will help to cater for different levels of understanding about this topic. Um, and that will be a really good one to work on, I think, because it will ensure that common understanding around the benefits of the integrity framework. Um, but one part I particularly like and the way they set out is the questions to ask. And I think they're great discussion starters. And I can see ongoing use of them in our board only time where we might consider maybe just one principle at a time in our meetings and use those questions to help us consider what we might be doing better. So that we're just having regular conversations about the governance principles. And I can see that helping to recenter the board on their core purpose so that we're continually having those conversations about governance and, uh, and also how we can improve. And so principle nine would be in action all the time. And I think they're all really applicable. Um, in having read through them, uh, principle number two, which is focuses on the team, is something that we've taken a big focus on over the last 12 or so months. So, and we're currently working on it, obviously, it's an ongoing journey. Um, but really, that's important for us to try and make sure that we've got an aligned and collaborative approach in governance. So, principally, how we're working more closely um, with our state and territory um, uh, boards and their CEOs. Um, really important that we can build and maintain those relationships so that we get that whole of sport approach and obviously something that was something that Rob mentioned before about the benefits that can come from that. So um, we we try and work with those other board members to consider what's best for our sport and our members and our participants. Um, and so some of the ways that we've brought that to life has been that we engage at a peer to peer level really regularly, both through formal and informal mechanisms. And I think having those conversations really adds, adds value to what we're trying to achieve. Um, and then we've also picked some areas of opportunity or improvement that we think that we can collaboratively tackle. And so we do that through a whole of sport working groups where we've got representation um, from each of the state and territory boards, but also in some cases from their CEOs as well. Um, and then we, we work together in those working groups to try and, um, as I said, tackle some of those challenges and improve our situation. So principle two has been something that we've been working on for quite some time. As I said, though, I think every single one of those principles has relevance. Um, sports moved at a rapid pace over the last decade and few sports nowadays are operating off a kitchen table and the expectations of the community are that um, sports going to be managed, governed and delivered right and the governance principles provide the framework to enable sort of good decisions made by good people. Um, I think one of the things that's often missed and is right up front in these principles is around culture and the fact that you know the daily actions of the people on the board, the people employed, um, the people who follow rules, bend procedures, um, maybe uh, can can influence the behaviours and, and the governance standards. So governance provide the opportunity to bring people back um, within a set of principles to make sure that the small things that over time could become um, consistent failures don't blow up into be big things and um, I heard Rob earlier talking about footy clubs and mine's the Essendon Footy Club and I think um, Lindsay Tanner's on, on notice is saying, you know, it wasn't that we that the Essendon Footy Club had bad people, it just allowed a lot of very small things to go unnoticed and they contributed to, you know, what we'd all say is a pretty much a disastrous outcome uh, in sport in the last 50 years. 
Staying with you, Grant, probably your next question. In your experience with Triathlon Victoria, now having reviewed the principles, are there one or two that jump out to you? And how are you going to go use, using these principles and bringing them to life? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I've got a role which is not only a, a State Sporting Association CEO, but also um, in charge as review manager of Triathlon's future operating model. And um, it's an interesting place to be in because certainly when reviewing the principles, the ones that stand out are probably the ones that resonate the most with that work, which is around uh, principle three being the game plan and the shared vision. Um, the fact that that needs to be well understood and I suppose enthusiastically embraced by everyone. Quite often a, they can be a bit of a tick and flick exercise. Um, the rule book, um, the, the defining of responsibilities of everyone within the, the federated structure. So, so what's an NSO going to do? What's a state going to do? Um, what are the clubs and members responsible for? And then I think the last one, the scorecard was one that really struck me, which is about trying to get our, our information and we have plenty of information and data, but seamlessly feeding into our performance reporting and monitoring um, and that our decision-making and our issue management can be as as seamless as, and as best practice as possible. Overall, I'll talk about it from a Hockey Australia perspective initially, but overall, I think we use the governance principles quite well from an organisational perspective. There's probably a couple that, that we had to work on in terms of probably the composition of our, for example, our finance, um, our farm committee. But in terms of the new governance principles, and as Chad's alluded to, you know, the, the sporting landscape has certainly changed a lot uh, since you know the, the principles were developed initially and then the mandatory principles were added uh, after that but in terms uh, of where hockey is at at the moment I think a couple of the principles that really apply to us at the moment and, and Chad's already talked about it in terms of the environment we find ourselves in now is a really good opportunity to look at uh, how you can actually do things differently uh, you know sometimes people can be threatened by change uh, but I think some, you've got to look at changes and opportunity as well to actually look at ways you can improve and do things differently and hopefully better. And from a Hockey Australia perspective, some of the principles um, surround that, that whole of sport approach, uh, that ability to collaborate with, with stakeholders, to have that level of engagement. And since I've been president, I think that's one thing I've really tried to focus on is that building relationships with our member associations, being our state and territories, and having a really collaborative, collective approach to try and get alignment with some of our systems and processes and we've implemented or started a project called Hockey Co-op which is effectively a, uh, a look at the one management principles and, and how we can look at being more efficient and effective in the way we deliver the sport across Australia at all levels. So it really talks to um, sustainability both as an organisation but also financially which is often a challenge for many organisations. Uh, and also for us, it's about responding to some of the new issues. They're probably not new, but they've probably come to the fore more recently in terms of that safe sport framework, um, integrity, you know, with issues like um, the sandpaper gate, the issue with the basketball. Uh, probably more recently, and I've just watched Athlete A um, with gymnastics in the US, which was a real eye opener for me, and probably touched on a few issues for us that happened post Rio. Uh, in terms of we went through a significant governance change, but also some of the issues surrounding athlete wellbeing and welfare. And I think as a board, there's some really key issues that you, we really need to focus on uh, and the holistic um, uh, approach to athlete wellbeing and development is really key moving forward. We see a lot of mental health issues in sport these days and as a governing organisation, whether it be an athlete, a staff member, a volunteer, you know, we're responsible for the wellbeing and welfare of all the people within our sport. So member protection uh, is another issue. Uh, we've seen, and I know John Mullins is on the call, but the rise of um, complaints and, and complaint handling, grievance procedures, and having a clear process and a transparent and robust process for dealing with complaints and the way we handle them is, is really important uh, with sport. Uh, so that, And that comes back to risk management and making sure that we're appropriately prepared to deal and we have the right processes, procedures and policies to effectively deal with risks and uh, those types of issues within the organisation. So from, from hockey, it's probably a bit more of that whole of sport approach. 
approach mm-hmm. for us. There's a couple of those uh, principles that really focus so it is where we're at. Uh, in terms of water polo, we're probably a little di- bit of a, a slightly different um, lead of evolution. We are looking at more governance changes with our with our national and state boards. Again, we're looking at more of whole of sport collective framework uh, with some states in probably more of an opt-in process, uh, looking at some alignment with some policies, national policies. So we are progressing it. We've had a significant change at, at board level and management level with a number of the states and territories, which has been positive I think because sometimes you have people with certain views and a certain history with the sport and sometimes you find it difficult sometimes they can be barriers to change and to progress and I think with the change in personnel I think it's probably unlocked some of those what I thought I think were barriers in the past it's unlocked some of those opportunities for water polo which uh, I think is positive for the sport so yeah that's probably from two different perspectives but um Although in, in different in, or different uh, areas or, or sections on the spectrum, I think we're all heading towards uh, a fairly united and whole of sport approach, which is which is good. I, I guess first up, if I just focus on Bowls WA for a minute, um, again, it's very timely at our last board meeting where we're actually talking about it's time to, uh, I guess, review our governance um, and, and, and I guess the governance structure of the sport as well. Um, and, and pretty happy that we're hopefully at the next AGM coming up in a couple of weeks that, um, that there are a couple of new directors coming on board and one's going to have a bit of a specialty around governance and, and so we can look at and, and having this document to work off is, is going to be perfect and, and I think it'll provide strong guidance on what we need to look at. In terms of Athletics West, as I mentioned before, um, Obviously, there's always challenges when you merge in two, two organisations and, and, and establishing a new one. The, the beauty of, again, if I, I'm speaking really highly of this document because I, I think it's probably the best piece of work I've seen come out for a very long time in terms of supporting, um, whether it be national sporting organisations, state sporting associations, and even for me looking at probably the the bigger clubs or centres we have in our sport that could easily take those principles and use them as a, as a bit of a checklist in terms of where they're at. Um, for us, three key principles I think we're certainly going to be looking at. Um, that very first one in terms of the culture of um, the organisation and the culture we want to establish and, and really assessing what that's going to look like um, and, and having I guess the the opportunity to put all our directors through a little bit of an assessment um, of what they believe the organisation of sport needs in terms of the development of of those cultures, those values, those behaviours and and really where we're at as as an organisation. And I think it becomes a very great educational piece for them as well. Um, Obviously, a number of them have done uh, different levels of upskilling or learning development around governance and, and 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 a number of the different principles but i think like anything the landscape changes so you need to be up with where we're trying to go especially when we look at the ramifications of COVID 19. The, the other one for me that becomes a, another really important principle will be the board charter um, i think we really need to understand that becomes the bible i think for our directors um, and and to me, I think it also becomes the Bible for management and an understanding how we need to operate as an organisation between board and management and the demarcation lines and, and the capacity still to go out there and I guess not to be afraid to look for new opportunities because the board charter will provide the framework that allows us to do that. And, and the third one really works in, you know, with pretty much what I've said is the, is the review of our risk management. Um, I think risk management, there's nothing wrong with it as long as we have a, a set of guidelines or a framework that we that we work within. Otherwise, I'll tell you what, if, we, if we're not prepared to take a risk on certain things, um, we will remain the same. And, and I think I heard Rob say before, um, you know, you can have people sit on boards for year in, year out, and they're prepared to take a risk, and we do the same, same, and the sport stagnates. So, 
uh, you know, and the and the rest of the principles. We'll, we'll work through those. Um, like I said, this document is just a fantastic tool for us, and it's very timely in terms of me being able to go to our next board meeting in a couple of weeks and saying to the chair, look, we have a great opportunity and we had already spoken about potentially the cultural session we need to have and um, and and a refresher of the principles will be. Having the new principles allows us, it's a good opportunity for us to now look at how we can improve things and do things better from what we're doing currently. Um, it's not saying that we're not doing things correctly at the moment or that um, things are not working, but it just allows us to look at how we might be able to improve and, and how we can be a better effective organisation, I suppose, to help grow our sport. Um, it helps us build the relationships and I suppose create alignment with our clubs, um, our associations and the volunteers to assist them and also understanding what governance actually is. I think um, certainly in our area, a lot of people come into uh, sporting and directors and so on come onto boards, they might not necessarily understand what governance actually is. Um, the benefit of these principles are that they are so clear, uh, they're whole of sport principles, so that um, if they've come from another organisation, they're able to adapt and um, have a good understanding already. Um, uh, so for us, it's really looking at um, making sure that we are being that transparent and um, communicating these across to all of our uh, clubs and associations so that they can also help build, um, but that we can also all just grow together as one um, rather than going down different paths and so on. So I suppose there's not one that really just stands out on its own, um, but that they are very clear and concise, I suppose, and able to easily be adapted to um, each of the areas. I guess um, just reading the principles, um, you know, there's a couple that really sort of resonated um, with me in terms of you know, current situations, but also previous situations. And probably the, the first one, first and foremost, that's probably why it's number one is culture. Um, you know, I really love the way that the principles are written in a way that uses that sporting analogy and it's the spirit of the game. Um, and the reason that is, is I mean, culture typically um, is defined as the behaviours that you are prepared to accept and walk past. Um, so, so, you know, what defines the culture of, of a particular sport um, or a club or whatever it is at every level. So, so understanding sort of what behaviours are we accepting and walking past and allowing to happen. So, so I think that's a really important one because it's a real reminder and a real anchor about, you know, why, why you know, that organisation is there. Um, but interestingly, I think coupled with, with some of the other principles, um, you know, when, when people are brave enough to, to call out poor behaviours whether or, or unacceptable behaviours or challenge it, um, you know, it, it's around, you know, how do we sort of acknowledge and, and necessarily protect some people that have been brave enough to, to stand up um, and call that out uh, and not just sort of dismiss that behaviour. So I think for me, um, you know, and that's that can be across whether it's on the field, whether it's spectators, participants, but it also could be, you know, on boards or um, um, subcommittees in terms of, you know, finance um, or risk and issues. So, so I think the culture and the way we view that is really important. Um, and probably um, the second one uh, that really um, sits well with me is, is around strategy. Um, and I think Rob touched on it a little bit um, because, I mean, I, I work in strategy and it's part of my day job and hence why, why I love it. Um, but I think what, what strategy provides is, is a, a roadmap um, and it provides a bit of a north star for everyone in the organisation. So, you know, if you understand the vision, the purpose of the organisation and the strategy on how they're going to get there, um, it, it really provides, you know, that underlying, if, you, if you're in a situation and you're not sure about the, the answer to a question or an action that you should take, it allows members or whoever it is to refer back to, um, to the strategy. Um, and probably just, just overall in general, um, the scorecard and in terms of the playbook, because, you know, as sport, we're always asking the athletes in our sport um, and coaches to embrace feedback. Um, so I think it's just one of those things that also underpins culture um, as well, just getting used to that ability to accept and seek out feedback regularly um, for always that, 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 that performance improvement culture. I think uh, getting that common understanding of what governance is or what good governance is 
I think that's something that and that Sports Australia and uh, plays a very important role, and that helps us get all on on onto the same page. I think we alluded to it earlier around that there's a number of different views on what governance is, let alone what good governance is. So I think the language that is used here, the accessibility. I note that you know when you go onto a board, most of us are volunteers, and we're ensuring that we're complying with the rules and are going concerned. And so other things can fall down the pecking order in terms of the intray. And this is what I like about the governance structure is, it, is that it ensures that instead of just focusing on, on any one thing that happens to be at, at the front of the queue, it's making sure that you're looking across the whole of the sport. And so I guess this will tie to my uh, comment on which of those principles are important. Um, all of them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. But I thought, well, okay, well, that's a glib answer. Let's let's dive into the detail. And so, I am now going to prove my own point that all of them, because first one that popped to mind was strategy and the game plan. Well, and culture. Okay, we need to get everyone on the same page, but we need a common understanding of what we're heading towards. You, you know, um, begin with the end in mind. Know what the common goal is and then set about the framework to, to achieve that, make sure you're communicating that, and then you go through to the, the principle five, which is the rule book, and making sure that we've got the foundations right, that we're meeting our, our regulatory obligations. And then you go to the, 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 the defense and the scorecard, which then making sure that you are checking against that, and then circles us back around to the behaviors. So I think they are all important. I think that without the common suite of principles, you are, are a bit like a two-legged stool, you're going to lose balance. Um, from our sports point of view, from water polo, it's really timely. We're um, currently reviewing our constitution. Uh, we have a federated model. What we're actively doing is seeking to deepen and strengthen our communication across the country and make sure that we're working collaboratively. And one of those key areas there is how can we as a national body work closely with and support uh, the, the state um, associations. And one of those key areas sits neatly within this, this governance space. And by having this common framework, that enables us a good starting point for that discussion. I think in terms of the governance principles being applied by national sporting organisations, um, the new sport governance standards, um, which sit within the framework, recognise that not, uh, well, that one size does not fit all. So when you look at the new sports governance standards, um, instead of saying from an outputs focused, um, does your organisation have a nominations committee? It actually looks at levels of maturity in terms of an outcome that you'd be wanting the nominations committee to achieve. So when we work with our NSOs um, in, in the months ahead, we're going to be asking each NSO board to consider with respect to those sport governance standards, where they currently are um, within each principle in terms of their level of maturity against, uh, against the standards. What that will do is give us a benchmark for um, one of the other components of the, the governance uh, framework, which is the sport advisory service. So the standards are a mechanism for both creating accountability and creating assurance around the governance um, outcomes of our NSOs, but also they're an opportunity to get in there and help our NSOs um, to improve um, and to ensure that they are committed to continuous improvement um, and not just picking the box. So a lot of these governance standards offer opportunity for sports to, to put in place a, a 12 month, a two year, a three year plan um, to improve. Now, how that relates to uh, funding is a question that we will consider continue to consider as an organisation, knowing that our focus is not on penalising people um, for not achieving governance outcomes, but for um, supporting them and advising them um, and creating accountability and transparency around the way in which they improve. Um, noting that no two organisations are going to be at the same level on those sports governance standards as this one bound to them. And that's a real change in the way in which we will be engaging with our national sporting organisations. The other thing that our sporting governance standards offer is an opportunity for our NSOs to publish. 
So NSOs could make the decision to publish in their annual reports or for their members the outcomes um, on an annual basis of the support governance standards and their governance improvement plan and what they're doing to in continually mature or, or improve against those standards. And that's a language that we all speak and, and all sports will be able to um, promote. Um, and that transparent discussion around uh, governance and the outcomes is really important. It also, um, as Andrew picked up, gives the sport an opportunity and, and Principle 2 really picks up on that collaborative governance theme. It gives the sport an opportunity to decide what it considers the priorities for governance improvement should be in the short and the medium and the long term and allows them to work together to achieve those outcomes. So what we really want to see, and, and I think the, the principles have got that, we've got 95 state sporting organisations and state sporting organisations for people with disability in New South Wales we recognise, so incredibly diverse sector and and we would like the principles so we'd like everybody to really be able to see themselves in the principles and and for them to to feel like they're really relevant to them i think they do like i really like what andrea said they're, they're much more practical i think this document the questions to ask are a really good focus for people um so so we don't make them mandatory monica what we do in our funding agreements with ssos is to encourage them to adopt the principles but what we've actually done in new south wales and it's been going for three years now is we've developed an sso organizational health check i guess a, a health tool and the governance principles are very much the focus of the tool. So, so um, all of the SSOs do it. Um, it's not linked to the funding, but we've, we've got a, a rating. And, and like um, Aaron said before, you know, gymnastics has come up very highly with outstanding organisational health. Um, so so we, we look at it like continuous improvement. It's not mandatory, it's not linked to the funding, but we certainly use it as a tool to rate SSOs so, so they can see how they're going against their peers. And we, when we do the survey, we've got it attached to, um, there are resources we suggest to people based on, on their answers to the questions. So, so very much using it, Monica, but not something that we, we actually mandate SSOs to adopt, but clearly we yeah. encourage them. I, um, I agree with what, um, what Kate's saying. Um, and I also, um, you know, I think, as I said earlier, it's, um, you know, it's about the um, the connection of the story across the um, across the federation, um, particularly up here in Queensland. Um, we've got the Activate Queensland strategy recently launched. Um, we went through an expansive consultation process to um, to put that strategy together, and um, I'd say. From our perspective up here, we, um, we're most interested in the outcomes that come from engagement in sport and recreation. Um, and um, in that regard, support the organisations that provide those outcomes to community. Um, and we, you know, we care about um, Queenslanders getting quality participation experiences. We care about sport being a welcoming and safe environment. We care about um, public funds um, being distributed um, and acquitted um, appropriately and transparently. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's important that we have um, governance in place to um, to ensure that those things um, are happening. I, I agree um, again with what Kate said about um, it being about continuous improvement and it being about, um, you know, how um, sports can have um, frameworks and processes in place uh, to ensure that we're working towards um, those those outcomes for um, the people who are engaging um, in the activities that we provide for community. Um, and in that regard, um, you know, is governance um, something that um, is um, are people expected to adopt? Um, the, the short answer that, to that question is is yes, but in general terms. So the way that um, that we fund sporting organisations um, and for those on the call that um, 
you know deal with this on a daily basis we we fund sports in accordance with a you know a funding agreement there are a range of um, there are a range of mechanisms in there where sports are expected to comply um, which is you know about compliance um, but I think um, you know it's more about the conversation the outcome that we're working towards and the collaborative approach that um, that we all uh, participate in um, to get people involved excellent thanks Chad I'm actually gonna Follow on question for you, if that's okay. One from the floor was, is the sport governance framework for only traditional sports or can it cover all organisations, physical activity, outdoor rec, et cetera? Sure, can um, I, can, um, I can have a go. Um, my, you know, my, my general thoughts on that um, are that, you know, and it relates to an earlier point that um, the principles have been put together under a sport frame. So um, in some instances, I would say that that is limiting um, because, you know, from a sport and recreation perspective, we often talk about, um, you know, the recreation sector, the unorganised, the unaffiliated. Um, so um, by choosing language that's um, peculiar to sport, um, that has the potential to be limiting um, and might, might, might make it difficult for people who um, are engaged um, in, you know, the less traditional sports. Um, that being said, I think the principles and the, the statements that underpin them, um, you know, are sound and have the potential for application um, across the board for anybody who is looking to, um, you know, to put in place practices to oversee their organisation. Uh, I suppose there's two parts to the question. So in terms of the, the first one being how we wish the, the governance principles to be applied is I think the diversity of the nine and as I said uh, earlier the focus on the values and the collaboration and looking at the culture will help broaden a conversation so often uh, when there are governance issues or communication between um, the clubs to the SSA or the SSA to the NSO um, it's coming back to where are the uh, culture vision expectations covered out so rather than this just focusing on what are the rules of the constitution and whether the board meeting is held a certain way it broadens that governance concept to looking at the overall culture of the sport both at a state level and national level and more importantly a local level as well um, in terms of how the sporting organisations would be required to adopt them within the industry investment program, which is the department's main funding vehicle for state sporting associations, we have a categorisation requirement. So with that, there's a scalability to how a sport receives investment. And with that is the complexity of the organisation across a range of things, including participation, its reach, how many regions it services, its performance and pathways, its governance, finance and planning. So historically, the department has used the governance checklist as part of its annual performance assessment with sports. And what we need to look at is the, the new document and the scalability of that. So whilst there's an expectation that we will wish all sports to be as governed as best as they can, there's also needs to be a scalability because some of our smaller sports just will not have the, the means or the complexity to be able to have it the same as some of our larger sports. So similarly to how we do our annual assessment and our governance courses and our range of learning and development, um, we see this as a, a widening of the concept of governance and we'd look to how this can be linked into the industry investment program going forward. But as I said, it needs to be appropriate to the size of the organisation and the scale of which we invest. Well, from a governing body perspective, we place an expectation upon ourselves to apply these principles. We quite doggedly as an organisation pursued the uh, best practice principles espoused by Sport Australia or then the Australian Sport Commission you know, for some time. We would hope that all sport organisations, certainly at the national level, adopt them quite thoroughly and with a degree of urgency even, because it will lift the bar for sport Australia wide. Now, I don't mind saying that. I don't mind seeing sports we're competing against for for engagement from participants, from uh, attention in media, I, I would be delighted to see that competitive bar lift and lift and lift because more and more sports are being well run. So I expect sports to adopt them and I expect them to do it fairly quickly.
that's from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective. We already encourage and support our state sporting organisations to focus on governance and planning, and we've certainly used the principles in the past, and we had basically um, developed state-level principles from those that were developed by Sport Australia. We think it's really important that the principles provide an overarching series of questions and examples for organisations to reflect on their current operations and also ask of themselves ways that they can be doing things better. And so we've always encouraged sporting organisations to look at what they currently do and how they currently operate and undertake a process of continuous improvement. And what I really like about these principles and the framework is that it really does provide, I think, greater narrative around the why and how of governance rather than the what of governance. And I think that's a really important learning. So I think has been touched on in, before by Ebony and by others, is there's a fair turnover of volunteers within the sport and recreation sector. And here in Tasmania, many of our state sporting organisations are totally reliant on volunteers. And it's really important to be able to attract skilled people to give of their time to serve on boards, that those boards have a very strong value set and a very strong understanding of governance. What we'd like the sporting organisations and individual directors to do, as I said, is to reflect on and then ask themselves the questions, both collectively as organisations, but also individually in relation to their own roles about how they're performing, what they could be doing better. And that's not a reflection on the fact that, you know, that maybe they're doing quite well already, but we're facing changing circumstances. And I think as Rob's alluded to, I mean, the current challenges are enormous. So there's not a roadmap there for any of us. So to reflect and think about and to take on the learnings of what we're dealing with and think about ways to pivot and adapt for the future is really important. We'd like the sporting organisations to do that, but not just to do it once, but to do it continuously as part of their normal performance evaluation, to look at and reflect at least annually and possibly more often. So to have effectively standing items where they're looking at what they're doing in terms of governance. Um, we'd be encouraging all of our sporting organisations to firstly be aware of the fact that the principles exist and then to look at how they actually apply to their own organisations and to set up a structured process whereby they're looking at how they're implementing those principles, how they're aligned with them, how they're not aligned and how in fact they could be better aligned or doing things better than they currently are. Um, it's our opinion that boards should see an opportunity to use the governance principles to start an ongoing conversation at board level uh, to develop a common understanding of good governance and to develop goals for the governance of their, their organisation. Um, so we would definitely encourage boards to take the board conversation from what we are doing now, which is operationally, um, to how we are governing. So we'd love the principles to encourage more strategic conversations at board level. Um, quite interestingly, during COVID, a number of sports have indicated that there's been more communication between the national and state bodies that there would normally be. So, you know, what a great opportunity to have further conversations about governance, um, particularly the cult about culture and values across all levels of sport. Uh, to sum it up, we're, you know, we believe that boards have a real opportunity to use the principles to, to develop a common understanding of good governance use the principles and standards as a tool to review their boards to understand where they have strengths and also to plan for improvement. Um, this may even be included in reporting to their members as a commitment to continuous improvement and encourage board memberships. Now, the second part of that question is, will sporting organisations be required to adopt them? Um, as South Australian organisations would be aware, the office is implementing Game On, uh, Getting South Australian Moving, which is a forward looking framework that outlines a collaborative approach to ensure physical activity and play can fit seamlessly into daily lives of South Australians. And at the same time, we're also, um, the, the recent grant review process post COVID is still being finalised. So, so whilst the office finalises the implementation process for Game On, the infrastructure plan, the grants review, uh, which South Australia would be all aware of, there is no definitive answer to the question of whether the office will require organisations to adopt the sport government principles at this stage. However, what I will say is that sport and recreation sector remains a very important partner. Um, so the office strongly encourages state sport and recreation organisations 
to engage with the sport governance frameworks to strengthen their governance and set themselves up um, to get the most out of these exciting new initiatives. Um, finally, without question, the governance framework empowers the boards to work together on enhancing sport governance in Australia, which we strongly endorse and support. The main thing that we would benefit from is uh, when we require some professional development and, and professional learning around the areas that we identify as the highest priority. So uh, I raised the example before about in integrity and, and certainly uh, uh, having some assistance to put in place and, and educate through to club level uh, the necessary components of our integrity framework. The governance principles themselves are a, 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 are a huge help because they do provide the, the framework. And, and a shout out to New South Wales, to, to the Office of Sport in New South Wales, because the benchmarking exercise that Andrew was just discussing ha has been a wonderful exercise in assisting to, to raise the level of governance across the state. Because what it does is it recognises good practice, um, but it also um, provides tools where you may be falling short and, and that in itself is very helpful. Uh, in terms of specific areas that, that may be um, of use, um, certainly around um, director review, uh, that, that is an area that is always very difficult um, uh, because uh, as, as we all know, we have uh, very skilled and very well-meaning directors on our boards who are often doing it in a voluntary capacity and um, it's sometimes difficult balancing the, the needs of director review against uh, the time and the, the, the time that they have available. So some, some assistance there may, may, be of, um, may be of benefit. We already do um, some work in this area and have done for some time. Um, I guess the arrival of these uh, principles um, and I guess more, just as importantly, the framework, um, the sort of broader aspect of not just the principles but the education and learning the evaluation assurance um, and uh, and the like um, means that uh, in addition to the exercise i mentioned earlier where we've been taking people from state sporting bodies at uh, board level um, and uh, and some senior staff um, we've been able to at least get them to the point where they uh, understand the roles and responsibilities um, and also can plug into other programs such as those delivered by AICD, supported by the state and by us in terms of delivery. But I guess this is another opportunity with these with these principles and the framework that goes with it to, uh, to have a look at um, how we might up the ante in terms of what we can offer. And I think uh, there was some discussion today at our board level about um, about this um, as we in this sort of COVID uh, impacted environment where people's capacity to uh, look at this type of material in some ways is enhanced um, means that uh, there's opportunities there for us to explore with our members and we have as Chad alluded to and um, there's been a lot of um, COVID related um, engagement between Q Sport and its member state sporting bodies um, with uh, Chad and his colleagues in the department uh, through to the Chief Health Officer. There's been a lot of um, positives come out of uh, which all lead to enhanced engagement. So there's a lot of conversation going on with their members about what they need and the arrival of these um, principles and the framework that it's embedded in um, means that um, it'll clearly become recommended reading. Uh, if nothing else, um, and and also, uh, I guess I'm as much interested in the uh, in the question of the standards, for the same reason that Chad uh, mentioned that you need to have a look at. Um, it's one thing to talk about principles about how you'd like people to act. Um, it's another thing to talk about how they can actually be measured, because that's where the continuous improvement proposition uh, eventually makes sense to people if they can see that they've been able to progress from. Yeah, you know, one stage to another. I think it's important, first of all, we understand that um, all sports are, are different and resource different and the needs certainly will be very different based on where they're at and I guess the capacity of that sport. Certainly for us, um, it's about understanding probably two things. Um, the, the investment that 
Sport Oz would like to make in terms of supporting us implementing um, those principles, you know, and I'm talking about in terms of uh, training development that, that hopefully would be available um, and whether that's webinars, running workshops, whatever the case may, may be, um, especially given the tough environment we, we're experiencing in terms of um, revenue streams, um, then, you know, that becomes a, a key factor certainly for us and, and depending on how many levels we want to go down to. I mean, if we if we have a vision that we not only do we want to do it as an organisation, but across the whole sport, then obviously there needs to be that sort of investment. The, the other thing that I always find really useful is um, is those case studies we get from other sports in terms of um, how they go about when they've implemented, whether it be you know one principle or the whole lot, um, how they've gone about reviewing where they're at as an organisation and, and what they've learned from that, that they can share, which obviously can save a lot of time um, and, and may mean that, uh, you know, rather than us having to go through a webinar or whatever, we can actually go, okay, this is how Sport X have, have done it. They're very similar in, in size and capacity as, as say, athletics is. Um, okay, that gives us plenty of guidance on what we can do. The other thing I think would be really useful to the document is what I would call a, a quick reference checklist. Um, so that, you know, sometimes, because we're all time poor, um, we can look at those things and go, oh, great, yep, 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 we've got that, we've, we've achieved that outcome. Hey, we're not too bad tracking against that particular principle and, and probably lines up very nicely with the uh, industry investment program Steve was talking about because um, I think the relationship between the principles and 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 that framework to me work hand in hand and I think that that would certainly certainly help us and I'm sure would help quite a number of the other sports so um, like I said it, it's if if we can leverage off learnings from other sports I, I think you know it's certainly implementing the principles will make life just a little bit easier. Our direct board is all volunteers. So as mentioned before, a lot of people um, don't have a clear understanding of what governance actually is or how to adapt governance and apply the governance. So assistance in that area in getting people, um, getting it out there for a start and having it available to everyone mm -hmm. to reflect on um, and then to get an understanding. But also given that these are that whole of sport approach um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the one sporting code working on their own in uh, um, applying them. Um, as part of the process in when we went through the process of um, doing this, it was really good to work with other sporting codes and understand how they see things and how um, they understand the, the governance side to be. So being able to continue to work with other sporting organisations to adapt these principles would certainly helped us um, in applying the principles. And then also that helps us to then um, take it down the line, I suppose, and assist our clubs and associations in understanding these principles as well. So um, yeah, having them available, but also being able to bounce off ideas from other sports will certainly assist in being able to apply them. So I think the um Pulling the, the principles together, that's the first step. The second one, I think, is the education and that consistency. So um, sporting organisations are, uh, as mentioned, are passionate about what they do and, and they're um, willing to implement and, and, and evolve. And what they'd like then is what the, the new document then to be committed to and that commitment to be ongoing. So it's not just the launch, it's a launch and then ongoing support and so that's what we're hearing and that's what we'd like to see and so as part of that that support is that the education piece which these roadshows are an important part of well are they called roadshows <laughs> um online shows um and i think also then support with the a a partnership in the support of the assessment of the implementation of them. So as a national board, we have had a governance review previously. I've been part of one of those and they were quite quite useful. I'd like to see that as a, a learning and a growth rather than a, um, and not that it was in the past, but not a gotcha exercise. That this is a way that we can identify areas for improvement and then go ahead and implement them. 
it depends on the level of organisation as well. And I've sort of been involved at, at all levels in, in governance from, from clubs to state bodies to national bodies. And obviously there's a different level of um, capability um, and um, I guess time around some of those those different levels. So um, in, a, in, in a nutshell, it's things like, you know, newsletters, case studies, and even I know in South Australia, I've been involved in a number of boards where um, Department of Rec and Sport sends one of their governance people to attend board meetings on a regular basis. And I think um, those opportunities are really helpful. I found them actually really as a board member um, and particularly one that wears a finance hat, being a chartered accountant. So it doesn't matter what board or committee you tune up to, you tend to get tarred with, well, you're the finance person, you're responsible for the going concern and the cash flows. Um, and it's that awareness that, you know, I think someone mentioned earlier that, that governance, when you put your hand up for a board or a committee, is everyone's responsibility, not just the accountants. And there's sort of no excuse for that. Um, in, in particular, a really good example, I think, you know, just to, to promote that risk discussion is, I was on the board for of Software Australia for a number of years and they developed um, a, a, a website called Home Plate, um, which was good on a number of fronts because it actually created a whole heap of templates around governance structures, so right down in the technical aspects. But um, it also allowed us at board level, um, it was a bit of a, um, a leaderboard in a sense as well. So, so there was transparency across the board and available ability and access to clubs um, for a whole range of things like constitutions and meeting minutes and all those and all those templates right down to that that level. So, so I think accessibility is the big thing about how do you achieve that, and um, it just means I think face to face as much as possible, and and having the state bodies or national bodies you know push that governance down into clubs and state bodies and just being present.